this video, we're gonna zoom in on the skills you need to run an inclusive team. What would the perfect inclusive team meeting look like? We're gonna explore answers to that question in this video. So first off, I wanna stand still by what we mean by inclusion. Inclusion is often misunderstood in organizations as just a general sense of belonging or family or groupiness. We know from a lot of research on inclusion that actually inclusion is a very difficult balancing act that it's an organization which satisfies individual need for belonging, as well as for uniqueness, that you are able to bring your full unique self to the organization, as well as have a reason to belong there. That often inclusion efforts skew a little bit more towards that organizational belonging side, and don't stand still and give enough space for individual difference. And it's hard because these two things are at odd. Being able to do both simultaneously is not easy. So we're gonna to talk today about how do you do that? How do you help a team have a sense of belonging while at the same time, a sense of safety for people to be unique and to be different. Again, I really want you to take away this, if nothing else, from the topic of inclusion, is you have to be constantly navigating the pendulum between belonging and uniqueness to hit that sweet spot where you truly have both in an organization. Now, we know that inclusion matters. Diversity bonuses depend on it. The ability of an uh, organization to leverage the moral case, the learning case, the business case. For example, some research that I did in the Journal of Applied Psychology, we looked at bank branch offices in the Netherlands. They were identical in terms of what they did, except for the employees inside, the diversity as well as the style of their manager. What I found in that data set across 200 bank branch offices was that ethnically diverse teams that were different in terms of race, they made more money in their bank branch office location when their leader was inclusive. When ethnically diverse teams had a leader that didn't have strong inclusion skills and could show bias in the way he or she showed up, ethnically diverse teams made less money than homogenous teams. So there's tremendous value to be gained from ethnically diverse teams. They outperformed homogenous teams, but only when their leader was inclusive. So let's look at what that means and where inclusion goes wrong in teams. There's three big buckets that I tend to think about that go in order in the sequence in a meeting. The first off is participation, that even though we have a diverse team, we often don't give equivalent airtime to all people. Next is once you have people speaking, we tend to get into arguments. And I know from research that 70% of the time those arguments are taken personally. So we're not able to leverage the diversity in teams because we take it personally. Finally, once you have teams talking and disagreeing and debating and starting to leverage diversity, you have to make a good decision based on the result of that meeting. And there's so many biases baked into the processes by how we make decisions and who we decide to listen to. So I'm gonna walk through skills to address each of these challenges today to help make your team more inclusive. So by participation, I mean sharing relevant information and data within the team. In a diverse team, every member is gonna bring unique ideas, expertise, and insights. However, what we know is that in a five-person meeting, one person does 80% of the talking. Think back to your last team meeting. What did that look like? More often than not, probably it was pretty skewed in participation, that some people were speaking a whole lot more than others. And this comes from evolution. We gravitate towards hierarchy. We feel comfortable when someone's dominant, when someone speaks more. We sit back and get submissive then because, oh, what a relief. There's someone in the room who's gonna take charge. This natural tendency, though, leads us to not make good decisions in teams and to not be inclusive. We need to sit in discomfort in a room where we're all equal for a little bit and say, hey, all of us have interesting ideas. Let's all share equally. If you don't do this, you lose out on the unique value of your team. So strategies to move, move forward. So one, build trust and psychological safety. Google set out to understand what was the number one criterion for high-performing teams in their organization. And they replicated what we already knew in a whole lot of research from Amy Emerson and others at Harvard, which is psych safety is the number one lover for a good team, for an inclusive team that's able to make good decisions. Psychological safety means an environment where people are willing to take a risk to share different ideas, bring their full selves. It's really important because a lot of people have a misconception that teams should be good friends. We should be highly cohesive. We should all get along and have a good time. Researchers say that's not true. A little bit of that is okay, but too much of that leads to groupthink and a lack of safety because it's very hard, for example, to really disagree with your best friend. Good work teams have healthy tension. There's respect, there's politeness. At the same time, there's directness and candor and a willingness to take a risk, make a mistake, give someone feedback. That's safety. How do you get there? 
Leader role modeling is a big deal. If someone expresses a mistake, an idea for an improvement, gives feedback, that needs to be celebrated. That is a gift, an opportunity for learning. And people look very closely to see how the leader reacts in those situations to understand what they should do next. Additionally, finding ways to make it easier for people to speak up is really important for psych safety. So the seating arrangements in a room, how big or small you are physically as a leader, even your tone of voice can send really big signals. There's some interesting research, for example, showing in in-person meetings, eye gaze matters. There's research showing that leaders often wouldn't make direct eye contact with people of color in the meeting, and this then inhibited them from speaking up and being able to join the conversation. And then if you ask leaders to intentionally direct eye gaze to minorities on the team, they were better able to get their voice into the conversation. There's also a lot of research on body language showing, for example, that if you make yourself big as a leader, it inhibits others' ability to speak up because you're taking up so much space physically. And that if you make yourself smaller, you might even raise your voice a little. It invites people to feel bigger themselves and to fill that space and to come in. Also keeping group size small, three to five people for a decision. There's way too many, many meetings out there that have like 20 people. And 20 people in a 30 minute meeting, of course you're not gonna have every voice heard. So breaking up your meetings into smaller meetings actually saves time and ensures that you're better utilizing your team because you're getting more voices heard. It also can help to have data given in advance of meetings, send out the agenda in advance, send out any pre-readings. You know, if you're going to have a discussion, have people prepare their thoughts on it in advance and share with one another so that when people come in, people have ground to stand on to engage in the conversation. So now you have people sharing information and discussing, but guess what? They're going to have different ideas and they may disagree. So what happens then? Well, I know from a meta-analysis I did, looking at all the publications ever done on conflict in teams, that 70% of the time when we're having a good debate about what strategy we should take and having different ideas, 70% of the time, this gets hijacked by relationship conflicts, status conflicts, power struggles. We take it personally. It's really hard for us to sit in the discomfort of someone thinking different than us. So we try to reduce the uncertainty and say, well, you know, it's not that my idea is wrong if he disagrees with me, he just is stupid, or he's a bad person, or he doesn't belong here. But you immediately, in your brain, to feel more comfortable, you make it personal, even when it isn't. So it's really hard for teams to leverage diversity because these conflicts are really hard to have and to do them well. So how do you do them well? Well, first off is recognizing a good conflict from a bad one. Good conflicts are those task conflicts. It's a discussion or a debate about the strategy, about how you're serving your clients, the goals of your team. Those good ones, the number one task conflicts, they often then are taken over by a relationship conflict, which is tensions between people of, oh, she just doesn't like me or she's not competent. Or process conflicts, which are very interesting. Those are the ones about the little things at work, over what time are we gonna meet or who's gonna do what. Process conflicts have never ever been shown to be good for teams. And the reason being, people don't really care about the little stuff like that. They don't really care about what time they're gonna meet so much to get into a fight. But usually if you do engage in a fight on those little issues, there's a bigger, hairier issue underneath that people don't dare to say. So if I'm fighting with you about meeting at 8 a.m., it's not 8 a.m. or the time that matters so much, but the fact that I feel that you're not respecting my identity as a mother, by scheduling a meeting at a time when I think you should know, I have to take my child to daycare. But I don't feel like I can say that, so then I just push back on the meeting time. So whenever you see these little process conflicts or fights about logistics, it's really important to call them to a standstill and then offline, one-on-one -on -one with the people involved, go to the underlying why of like, what is really happening here? Let's resolve that. But if you just let it go on the surface, they're never going to be resolved because no one really cares about them so much. They care about the underlying issues you're not saying. One of the biggest underlying issues next to relationship issues, which are hard to air, are status issues over, I don't feel respected. I feel like I deserve a promotion. I don't respect your confidence as a leader. And those are very insidious. And so whenever you're having that good task debate, it can often quickly broil into a relationship conflict, a process conflict, or a status conflict. So how do you keep it on target? How do you stay true to a true task debate? Well, one, data should be the currency of any good team. That you value data, you value input. And when people offer opinions, not just, I just think this. But instead, here is my hypothesis, here is the data that I have to support it, here's a report, here's a statistic, here's an interview, here's my data. And when people show up in that way, that should be celebrated. At one point, I was brought in to consult for one of the more famous venture capital firms in Silicon Valley. They had realized that they had made some bad investment decisions, including missing out on a big unicorn in the valley that everybody else got in on. And so they're trying to do a post-mortem of how this happened. 
And so in walking through that with them, we realized that for them, data wasn't their currency when they were making investment decisions. Instead, seniority was. And so, for example, in that specific case, one of their junior associates had done the due diligence on the company, and they were very big on the company, saying, this is a big opportunity. Here's the data for it. Senior partner stepped in and said, well, in my 20 years in the Valley, I've never seen a good idea in that industry. You can imagine. And they didn't invest. And so within that firm, they had to reshift their focus and their influence dynamics, their ability to have conflict, to be debating data, not to be debating other topics, to stay true to data, listen to the data. Part of this then also means avoiding those positional stances over, I've been in this industry for 20 years and I just know. But more so, I have an idea or a hypothesis that this might be true, here's my data. And then when someone shows up in that way and say, hey, why? Could you walk me through more data? Why do you think this way? If it starts to shift, if it starts to get emotional, make sure that you know what's really going on. Are you still talking about the data or has it turned into a relationship conflict, a status conflict? And if it has, pause it in the group meeting, go offline one-on-one to figure it out. And then as you go, when you're engaging in this conflict, words matter. Try to show up in ways to show that you trust people, that you respect people, that you presume good intent. And be curious when people have questions. Okay, so you're participating. You're having some healthy task debates. Now you have to decide. You've had a big debate back and forth in strategy A or B. How do you make the right decision? Well, the issue is, as we're hearing out this debate in our team with strategy A versus strategy B, we often ascribe influence and confidence to people for qualities other than just data or their task competence. And this is from evolution. We've gravitated towards dominance from the cave person days, where we like someone that's strong to tell us what to do. And so this means when someone speaks more deeply, there's a lot of research on this. I actually had a vocal coach when I first started teaching to help me lower my voice so people would take me more seriously in the classroom. So lower voice leads to influence your height. We talked about American CEOs in this course being six feet tall, dominance, right? strength, attractiveness. When we see people like that, we let them have influence. But again, for a team to make a truly good decision in an inclusive way, it means looking at the data and not the qualities of the person speaking. So in one of my papers that we did, we did a computer simulation modeling how teams described influence and made high quality or low quality decisions. In this computer simulation, we're able to model how people follow Expertise, but as well as other qualities, such as dominance over time. When teams follow expertise and let that person lead, they make better decisions. We replicated this in a field study of Dutch tax collectors. And then in a really cool lab study that I wanted to share with you, we found similar effects. So in the laboratory study, we had students work in groups coming into the laboratory. And this is at Stanford, really smart undergrads. We had them do a game called Desert Survival, where each student on their own had to rank order the utility of 12 items to survive in the desert as a group. We gave each of them their score of how well they did on their own. And then we asked the teams to choose a leader. They objectively knew how good each person was at this task. They had the data, the score written on the foreheads of each other, who knew most for this task. When they went to choose their leader, only 55% of the students, smart undergrads who are about to take over the world, chose the leader to lead who knew most to have the most data for that task at hand. 45% of them, nearly half, chose as leader, even after hearing these expertise scores, they still chose as leader the person that was the tallest, that was the most dominant, that spoke the most, that had the deepest voice, that was the most attractive. Should be terrifying about the state of the world, right? Well, you can imagine what we found. Teams that chose the leader who had the most expertise for the task, they performed astronomically better. They survived in the desert, they got out, and they made an objectively good team decision. Teams chose the leader that was too dominant, that was assertive, that was agentic, that was attractive, they did not make a good decision as a team. So it really matters then, even if you have your team talking and debating, when you make the final decision of who you're going to listen to, you have to be anti-biased. You have to really look for the data to make the decision. So how do you get there? So making sure that conversation stays true to expertise, that before you go into a meeting of asking who knows what. I've consulted a bit with hospitals over the years, and they really struggle, for example, with an ingrained hierarchy that whatever the surgeon says is law. But sometimes the nurse or the patient might actually have more information or better information to make the decision. So one of the things they start to do now is having check-ins before decisions of who knows what for this case, and surveying the expertise in the team. Because it could be the nurse just did this procedure yesterday, but the surgeon hasn't done it in 15 years. The nurse might actually have more useful information. So sussing out who knows what in advance of a decision is helpful. 
training leaders that have humility and that are willing to shift decision influence to the person who knows most, including letting them run the meeting, facilitate the meeting to make clear they're the ones guiding the process because they're the ones that have the most expertise, and therefore rotating meeting control to the person who actually has the most data. So in sum, what's natural from evolution of this gravitating towards hierarchy, gravitating towards people that are similar than us, you know, trying to reduce uncertainty by making it personal, these evolutionary tendencies make for bad group decisions. We can and need to do better. So how to do this? Manage participation, make sure everyone's heard, avoid the bad conflict, embrace the good, stay true to the data and ask why, and make sure you know who knows the most and give the person with the most data the most influence. Good luck in running inclusive team meetings.